our second class in crisis communication. Last week, we looked at communication models and basic aspects of the communication process, and we went through three stages of the basic crisis intervention model. We said that we wanted to clarify the crisis, we wanted to stabilize the situation. Did you like our Dr. Hall? Uh, I thought so. Not. I'm three, she's four. Okay, you didn't turn me on, Joe. Only your hand will show. There we go. Okay. So just grab okay. some stuff and think we'll be great. And you know, kids, teenagers. All right, we'll try this again. <laughs> Nothing like little crises to get the class started. <laughs> Uh, last week, we reviewed the basic communication model, the communication process. We looked at uh, three general stages of an intervention model and said that we wanted to clarify the crisis, stabilize the situation, develop an action plan, and we talked through those things. We defined crisis. We compared crisis to emergency, some of those things. Uh, we also classified crises as being situational, maturational, are existential. And tonight we're going to be looking in more depth at those and trying to identify some of the kinds of crises that occur at those different levels. <clears throat> I'm counting on a lot of input from the class tonight. Uh, we've got some sock puppets out here and I'm hoping that these people are going to uh, lose their inhibitions and, and use those later on as we try to uh, share and uh, recast some of those scenarios for you. But let me ask you this. What is the earliest crisis that you, rec the earliest age at which you recall having a crisis? Karen? Um, I was in probably about age four. I was at nursery school and had gotten a major tear in my Halloween costume. Oh, and that's serious, isn't it? For me, it was. Right. Okay. Anything earlier than that, Robert? Oh, okay. Well, go ahead. Uh, when I was about, uh, let's see, uh, third through third, fourth, and fifth grade or so, I had this terrible fear of needles. So whenever I went to the doctor, it was like, I mean, total fear, panic. It's like a panic attack. So. Okay, we'll be looking at those more later on, but uh, that's a, a real situational crisis, isn't it? Okay. Anybody want to add anything for the moment? Okay. Roll your mind backwards. You know, probably birth is the first real crisis that you have to deal with. Now, most of us don't remember it. There are a few people who say they do, and under hypnosis uh, seem to provide pretty good details on that. But whether you recall it consciously or not, uh, the jolt that brings you into the world is probably the first crisis you have to deal with. You're leaving that nice, safe, secure environment, and here you are cast into reality. Okay, time goes along. Here you are, a cute little baby at home. Do you have any crises at that point? Karen? I would imagine that, for the baby anyway, the first time mom leaves and doesn't show up immediately when they cry is a crisis. Okay. Anybody want to play a baby yet? <laughs> okay, we'll see how this goes. Um, what, what does baby need mom for? Everything. Okay, what do babies need? Robert? They need a, a food. food. Okay, they need food. You going to wear the same diaper all week? No, they howl a lot when it's time to have the diaper changed. Okay, yeah, Allison. Yeah, just hold the button down to talk. They need touch and uh, constant um, interaction with other people. Okay, what happens to children and babies that don't get touch? They cry. They cry, okay, and... If they're deprived over time, what happens? Allison, they don't. Hold the down. They don't learn to correctly socialize, and they have um, a lot of emotional problems when they grow up. Being able to have 
situational relationships with people, whether it be, you know, work, friend, parents, whatever. Okay. Have you heard the stories of children that are locked away in closets, locked up in rooms that are, are really abused? Uh, they have all kinds of, of adjustment problems. Okay. Well, so mom take and dad, well, we share those responsibilities now in the modern generation. Modern dads learn how to change diapers and all. We've got this baby that's been loved and fed and touched and stroked and had its diaper changed and its bed kept clean and all these, and all these wonderful uh, toys to play with. And it's now two years old. Any crises? Nancy? Another sibling is born in the family. Oh, threatening my. everything. And what happens? Well, I think immediately, um, you know, he does not get the, or he or she does not get the attention that they're used to. And so they may start acting out or, you know, giving the baby an extra tight hug or, you know. A pinch? Something. Yes, yes. Would you like to play a naughty child? Naughty two-year-old? A naughty two-year-old? Do <laughs> you feel the spirit moving you yet? Ginger, if this, if this two-year-old belongs to you, what are you going to do with her? Do I need a baby to rock? Probably. <laughs> and you will kind of move right. your puppets toward the center. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> It's okay, it's okay. Okay, we're not getting you on camera. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we are now. Yeah, we are. Okay, we got to get these puppets for posterity oh, you here. I, you don't have to do that. I've got the oh, mic on. Yeah. Okay. Um, why is that baby always sitting? I'm sorry, I don't know if I can talk. Oh, just, you. just talk. <laughs> yeah. Why is that baby always in your lap? He always in your lap. I'm on in your lap. Well, I can try to make room for both of you, but you have to be gentle with the I, baby. I don't want the baby. I want <laughs> on your lap by myself. Well, it's not your turn right now. No, it's my turn. <laughs> 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 well, well, okay. Here, you lay down for a minute. Come here. It's all right. Who wants Mama to be the baby and cry? I still loves you. I need somebody to cry. <laughs> Just, oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Well, well, Remy, the baby uh, needs me. <laughs> Father, where's supper? <laughs> where's supper? <laughs> I'm having three crises at once. That was good. Guys. Good. That you want to stay up here? Okay, I'll That'd stay be up easier here. for you. Okay, is this typical? Yeah, unfortunately so. Uh, is there a perfect answer for it? No, I think probably mom was doing the best she could here. Uh, are there things you can do to help a child accept a new baby? Uh, maybe include the baby, like if you wash it, you know, let the little one help give you a bath or, you know, help put on booties or something, kind of include them. Okay, maybe before the baby ever arrives, start getting them primed. Robert? Just telling the older sibling that, that the baby's not going to become, uh, it's not going to be put in your place. Like, just because the baby's here doesn't mean we're going to love it more than you. You know, just telling it that. And, but maybe some forewarning that turn taking will have to occur. I think too, in making sure you're going to be very busy with the baby, that you spent you spend some time just alone with the two-year-old, and they know, like reading or something, they know that you spent that time with them. So, okay, good. Oh, y'all did that so well. That was just lovely. <laughs> okay. Um, we want to remember too something we mentioned last week. I'm not sure we actually put a visual up on it, but we said that a crisis for one person may be ordinary work for someone else, maybe routine for someone else. You know, if any of us had to perform surgery, I think we'd be in a world of trouble instantly. And yet there are people who do surgery for hours, day after day, and for whom that's a normal thing. Um, 
you know, most of us, if, if our computer goes down, if the printer won't even take the paper properly, we're frustrated and upset. And yet there are people who manage that with uh, uh, professionalism, and it's a, a normal part for them, a normal thing for them. So we want to remember that a crisis for one person may not be for someone else, and therefore if we can learn how to deal with these things, uh, then being prepared, having ideas about how to manage the crisis means that we may be able to avert that uh, down the way somewhere. Okay, we're past two, coming up on three, rolling into four. Is your life changing yet, Karen? Well, probably, maybe even before two, but certainly after. Um, You've probably given up the bottle or, or whatever else we've had to have been forced oh, into. Yes, into we've it. left that out, didn't we? And that was that was a real crisis at my house for the, probably two or three weeks. Somebody was desperately trying to convince us to to let him go back. Okay, I had one daughter, and she'll go nameless because she may be watching this tape later, who negotiated giving up her bottle. You know, I mean. It, I have three daughters, and, and a couple of them hung on to it till they were nearly two. But one said, "I'll throw it in. The, I'll throw it in the trash for your birthday, mommy." <laughs> and she did. The birthday came, and she threw it in the trash. And uh, my husband and I looked at each other and said, "Is this real? Does she know what she's doing?" And when she went off to play, we got it out, cleaned it up, and hid it in the cabinet just in case she reneged on her commitment. No, but she didn't. Oh, she, she had kept it long enough, I guess, that she was rational and, and needed some reason to give it up and so forth. Uh, when another child was sick at age four, we gave a bottle back to her to drink apple juice out of, and that was a very reassuring kind of thing. Uh, you didn't have to be all big and grown up when you were sick. You could go back to drinking your apple juice out of a baby bottle. Another crisis that occurs Anywhere between six months, a year, depending on when you walk. What happens when you start to walk? You're thinking it. At first you do a lot of falling down. You fall down a lot, don't you? And it hurts. I mean, if you land on your diaper, it's okay. You know, but you see a lot of one-year-olds, 18-month-old, month-olds, uh, that are pretty banged up. Uh, and if they walk too early, one of ours was walking at nine and a half months and really traveling at ten months, she was so short that she went under the tables. And then when she grew, she smacked the tables and over she went backwards and, you know, she took some really good bangs. And most of us don't think about that, you know, I mean, un until our own kids are into it. Okay, so you're pushing four years old or so. Allison, what happens? Well, to go back even further, you were talking, um, potty training is a real big crisis experience for little children. I mean, is, for, who, for who's, them. It, who's it worse on, the kid or Well, the it's worse on the parent because it's so frustrating if they don't catch on. But also if, you know, like later if they have episodes of bedwetting and things like that, that turns into a real traumatic thing for them too. You know, one, one of my neighbors, who will go unnamed, said that, you know, she had one child trained really early, but she never was sure whether it was the child that was trained or whether she was the one that was trained. You know, if you just learn to catch it on cue. So, <laughs> works both ways. But yeah, that, that's significant too. I remember at the child care center here at U of H, the two-year-old teacher would, uh, received the new young twos in the class and was very patient in changing diapers and all that. But about mid-semester after Christmas, and she doesn't work there anymore if somebody out there is trying to figure out who I'm talking about. Uh, after Christmas, if you were still wearing a diaper, unless you were a young two, you had to change your own diaper. You know, it was like, you know, you're pushing three now. It's time we get on with potty training and so forth, and if you choose to wear a diaper, okay, but you can change it. And so she had these big two and three-fourths year olds, you know, flopping down the floor doing their own tape tabs and so forth. And so, but so, you know, so, so many, 
that was an action plan. She considered <laughs> her choices. <laughs> she got consensus. <laughs> no. Okay, are you thinking something? Okay, Rob. Isn't it by the time they get to be about four years old, they start to enter preschool? Mm -hmm. And that, for some, can be a crisis. Some, I mean, they just, it's just enjoyable, but some can be, can be a crisis. Okay, what makes the difference here? Do we know? Nancy? The classes in preschool are somewhat, uh, where they're more structured. And I have three boys, and for little boys, that's a bit difficult. A lot of the structure that goes into it that's necessary for what they're learning. Okay. And, and what about this separation from mom thing? For a lot of them, it can be the first time that they're away from mommy for more than an hour or two hours, and it's not someone familiar. It's not like they're at grandma's. Mm -hmm. That's different. It's a stranger. It's a strange place, and this is the first time mommy's not there. So is there something that could be done about this? The first few times, I mean, you could try and maybe make it short, but ultimately, I mean, I have a friend who, who I think her oldest was almost three before she really left them with anyone else besides herself, and it was really hard on her kids to make that adjustment. I think it's easier if you kind of do it, you know, in short intervals and bend so that the child learns, I will come back. I was going to say the same thing kind of goes for uh, the first time parents go on vacation and leave their children with a relative or a friend because you know, my mother constantly tells this story of when I first was left with my grandparents and how I just screamed and cried and it made my grandparents cry because I was so upset and you know, it's hard for me to believe that now and that I'm all grown up, but, you know, but that, it, it can be real hard, you know. I've had to babysit a lot of children with their first experience, and it just takes a lot of, you know, nurturing and cuddling to calm them down. Okay, yeah, I think you're on the right track here, the, the short and frequent, and, I mean, as a career mom, you know, and, and two of my girls were on semester breaks, you know, so <laughs> we really kept uh, things going. And even with the first, I was only off from work three weeks. So they, they were in limited child care before they knew what was happening to them. Uh, but they learned that daddy could take care of them, that he could cuddle, that he could give them a bottle. When they got on baby mush later on, you know, he knew how to open a jar and shovel it in, too. Uh, you know, and, and they learned early on that, that there was, an, there was a, an assortment of people who were responsible and would take care of, of them. Okay. Oh, anybody want to play a kid going off to school or separation from mommy? <laughs> You're thinking out there. <laughs> Dad, you want to take him to school? I'll go first. I'll go first. Okay, we're going to have the guys get brave here. Are they going to take each other to school? I don't know. What's going to happen over there? Who's going to be, be the dad? Somebody has to be the dad and somebody has to be the kid. I'll be the preschool teacher. We'll just call you Johnny <coughs> and Mr. Baker. I'm the teacher. Okay, Johnny. I want you to be on your best behavior today at school. Okay? I'm going to be back what very do you, soon. What do, you, what do you mean, school? You're going to go with the teacher today. I don't want to go with the teacher today. <laughs> yes, you're going to go with the teacher today, and you're going to do exactly... Look at me. <laughs> Exactly what she tells you to do. We'll have no, lots of no, fun, Johnny. I'm, I'm not going with teacher today. Goodbye, Johnny. Come on, Johnny. Let's Dad, go. Let's Dad, go play with the Dad. toys. Goodbye, let's go Dad. play with the toys, Johnny. No. no. Dad, oh, no. let's go play with the toys. No. It'll be all right. No, I don't wanna It'll be all right. No, I don't get It'll be all right. No. Come on. <laughs> We're gonna go play with the Tigra toys. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. You want to come and play house? Want to play house with Cindy? <laughs> that was good. Give those guys a hand.
<laughs> now, when you have that kid in your class, Robert, what are you going to do? You have to think of everything. You have to think of, uh, well, do you know about the Power Rangers? And like what she was doing, let's go play house. You have to think of anything to distract them at the time. And then, but the main thing is the father or whoever it is, the parent, they have to not be seen. I found out that w as long as the kid can see the parent, it's tearing the kid up. But when, when I start having control over the child is when the child no longer sees the parent. So I think there's something there. Okay, the child that. needs to believe it, and this needs advance attention too, doesn't it? Plenty of assurance on the front end that I will be back to get you. Learn to look at the clock when the hands are in certain positions, that's when I'll be back. And if the teacher and the parent know that, then the teacher can say, we're going to watch the clock together and so forth. Yeah, one thing that was they did in their role playing that you wouldn't want to do, mm -hmm. it, it almost sounded like dad was springing this on, on the kids. <laughs> what school? Guess you know? what? <laughs> but they play that too. They pretend that they don't know what you're talking that about. That they've never heard of this they've before. Never heard of this before? <laughs> Does anyone you know ever do this? No, not my kids. <laughs> what? I have college students who do that. I had a meeting with you, Dr. Hahn, the other day. It was last week? I thought it was next week. Okay. Where are we? We got this kid in preschool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, sorry. I'm just going to say, well, I think what helps is, for me, I had an older sibling that went to school, and I could not wait to go to school and be like her and have friends and bring home my little glue pasty things, put on the fridge. I mean, that really helped, being a middle child, having the older sister go to school. Okay, good point. And if that whole anticipation builds, you're getting new clothes for school, you're getting a lunch box, it's a Power Ranger lunch box, so forth, then, then that builds toward a positive experience. Okay, the elementary years. They're almost as bad as adolescents. But what, what kind of crises do we have in elementary school? I, when I, on the block I lived in when I was preschool, I was kind of queen of the block. I oh, don't know yeah. why, but I had, you know, I seemed to be the person that everyone followed what I wanted to do. Were you the oldest? Um, no, or I don't think so. Favorite? I think I'm just the fastest talker. Oh, so maybe okay. no one else got a word in edgewise. <laughs> okay. But when I got to, to elementary school, that wasn't true. I wasn't queen of the playground or even my grade. And I, in fact, I spent years in elementary school trying to figure out why other kids were more popular than I was. Did you ever figure it out? Not really. The only time okay. I thought I even had, even, even got an edge up on one of them was I had an older, a brother who was older than hers. But, you know, that didn't cut ice for very long. Because I, I do some computer classes for HISD after school, four days a week. And I watch the patterns, you know, if you tried to draw a sociogram of the dynamics that's going on there, and they're constantly shifting, you know. Now, there's some children who seem to have more charisma than others for, for whatever reason. Maybe it's verbal adeptness, uh, the ability to think. Maybe they have neater toys uh, and so forth. But it's interesting to watch that, that power and control shift. But now what, what do you, let me get you talking again. What, what's going on here? What do elementary age kids do to each other that cause crises? Allison? They tease each other, they pick on each other. Okay, what kinds <laughs> of things do they tease and pick about? Um, their size, whether they're, you know, tall for their age, skinny or heavy set for their age. Okay, uh, physical attributes. Physical attributes. Um, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're Maybe too tall, you're you too don't have the right kind of Barbie doll that somebody else, you know, they'd say, oh, well, my toys are better than your toys, or um, sharing is always a big thing, learning that mine doesn't work all the time, you know, having to be told no and that you have to share a room and share people and but you have a hands-off policy and you also have to learn to have your own space 
you know, I think that's the first time, it, you know, unless you have other siblings, <coughs> like I was an only child and growing up when I went to school outside of the two or three neighbors that I had, that was a big experience. Were you spoil rotten? Meeting kids. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I had, a, I mean, I had everything I ever wanted growing up mm -hmm. until I was 14 and then I got a stepsister, a half sister, and that just was gone from there, so. Okay, somebody want to play elementary age children? I watched them doing things to each other like you can't be in my club. <coughs> Nancy? Uh, one of the things that I, it seems like to me that I remember in elementary school or that my children have had trouble with is experiences whether they're even peers or a teacher or somebody that's in an official position that causes them to feel shame about themselves because they're entering the cruel world. And I can think of uh, a couple of instances where that, you know, seemed to create a lot of pressure in the child, creating a crisis where they would cry or not be able to handle it like they normally would, you know, on the playground or just where. <clears throat> what do you do with a crybaby at school? Are you talking about as a teacher or a fellow student that's with a crybaby? <laughs> I mean, how, um, which, which... Well, either way, I, I was thinking of it from the teacher's standpoint. If, you had, if you're in third or fourth grade, I guess you get more criers, though, kindergarten, first grade. Although, sometimes you, you still get a few older grades, and of course they take a lot more heat for it from their peers. You know, if they break down and cry in fourth grade, they're going to hear about it for probably a good month or more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as an adult, what do you do with criers? I'm crying because it's one o'clock in the afternoon and I want my mommy to pick me up now. Nancy? Well, first of all, I would acknowledge that they're crying instead of pretending like they're not crying or being, being uncomfortable with them crying, say, you're crying. Could you tell me why you're crying? And a lot of times they'll stop crying to tell you why they're crying. Okay, you know, just good. Just be able to discuss what they're feeling. Yeah, I can't understand you when you're crying. Can you stop crying long enough to tell me what the problem is? And that sometimes works. Okay, if it's more in the temper tantrum category. Well, once you ascertain that, that they're crying for something that they can't have and that they know they can't have, except that they're attempting to get it, you know, using crying or whatever as, as like a temper tantrum as a, <clears throat> as a power tool trying to get that, and sometimes it obviously works somewhere. And this may be somewhere. school or home, too. Right. And, and so then you have to simply demonstrate that that doesn't, re you know, you can't do anything that would reward that behavior. And to some degree, sometimes even just paying attention to it as a reward. Larry? If you're a parent and given into a temper tantrum, then he knows that he can use that technique to get what he wants in the future. I used to babysit a kid <clears throat> pretty regularly, and he would, that's how he communicated with his mother. Throw a temper tantrum, and he'd get his way every time. His, I remember one of his first few sentences was, Give me one more chance. Give me one more chance. And he and I asked him one day because I I wouldn't I didn't like to put up with that baby thing. I'd say, Do you know what "give me one more chance" means? Do mommy let me do it? He didn't even know what it <laughs> meant. And he just said, "Give me one more chance," and scream, "Give me one more chance!" And his mom, okay, every time. But I just I wouldn't do that. I'd just say, "No, this is how it is. You know, you're not going to have a big snack before your dinner." And he'd cry for a little while, and then he'd kind of forget about it. And then he'd eat all his dinner, and his, his mom or mother could understand how I got him to do that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I've heard people, I don't know if I use this or, or if it worked, but telling a child when there's no consoling them, your crying hurts my ears. And so if you're going to continue to cry, you can, but I'm, you're going to go in the other room until you can stop crying, and then you can come back in here and <laughs> join us. Yeah, that's good. You can tell them you like I'm doing everything I can to help you. Now it's your. It's, in other words, put the ball in their hands. It's like I've I've given you the options, and now it's it's your opportunity 
I mean, you don't say it the way like that. Right. right? So you, in essence, what you tell them is, "Hey, well, look, you do to I've help done me? everything to help you out, or whatever. Now it's your, you know, it's your chance. You know, it's like that. You're not the bully. You're not the one that's the mm -hmm. evil person." Yeah, and kind of a blend between those sometimes to say, you know, you can stand here and cry if you want to. You know, I'm not impressed with this behavior. You know, and I'm going to choose not to listen to it, and I'll either send you to your room or I'm going to leave you standing in the corner sobbing and blubbering, and I'm, you know, the rest of the class or, or the rest of the family is going to go on with dinner. Maybe they don't like the menu that night. Allison? I was going to say, you can um, give them other options and ask them, you know, well, instead of throwing yourself on the floor and kicking and screaming, is what else could you have done to have gotten my attention in a way that without screaming and crying, you know, or what could, you, you know, how could you have asked for this nicely and maybe next time that you ask for it nicely, I'll be willing to give it to you, you know. Okay. Is Hmm? It could be exhausted. Okay. Yeah, you can talk loud. <laughs> I know. I didn't mean to talk. Sometimes they're just exhausted, and so they cry. But they're different when they do that. But and and, and when they're in, in that kind of state, there is no reasoning with right. them. At that point, mm -hmm. better to go let them go lay down in a corner and quietly sob because then they will fall asleep. That's right. But you have to be able to recognize that that could be an option, especially if they're totally irrational. You have to know your receiver, know the other communicator. Okay. Yeah, is any one of these the perfect answer? No. If it was, somebody would have printed it in a book and published it and been rich by now. Uh, we're just saying, we're really, you know, as we, as we look back at our action plan, we're saying look at how many choices we have in this situation. Can we reason with this child? Can we negotiate? Can we distract them? Uh, can we coerce them? I mean, you know. How many choices do we have in dealing with this? And, and the odds are that you may go through several of those uh, before you find one that works. And you may find that the same thing doesn't always work, that what will work one day doesn't work another day because the individual's tired or whatever. But uh, you know, most of us, looking back, would probably say the elementary years were good years. Uh, I mean, unless you're in, a, in an abusive situation or, or had some, some heavy problems. And yet, it's all by comparison. You know, we're going to see as, as we move on through these levels that as life gets more complicated, uh, it usually has more crises in it. And at least to me, elementary school looks good now by contrast. Maybe it's Alzheimer's <laughs> too. You know, I don't remember it that well. Uh, but when we stop and think about it, we recognize that at that age level, they've got crises too. You know, learning to multiply was a big deal once upon a time. Some of us still can't add. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the things that were being mentioned about learning to share, learning to wait your turn. That wonderful book about everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten is a real good one. If, if you haven't read it, I want to refresh your memory on it. Uh, but, you know, learning to wait your turn is a big deal for some kids. Learning to share, uh, all the peer pressure stuff, the socialization that goes on at that age. Uh, learning if you've always been the one in charge that you may not be the one in charge. You know, or you may be today but not tomorrow because somebody else wants that turn. And for some children these things kind of go with the flow and with others they're very harsh awakenings and it's difficult at that age level to deal with. Okay, what happens about fourth or fifth grade? It hits the girls first. Allison. Well, pre-puberty or puberty right around there, unfortunately it hits some girls when they start about nine years old and then mm -hmm. waits with others maybe till I had friends that were still in high school that nothing was going on for them. So. Okay, one of my st student teachers a few years ago said, fifth grade, hormones gone amuck. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden the attention span is reduced, it's diverted. Uh, the girl starts smuggling the lipstick and perfume and all this stuff to school. 
uh, they want the lights out in the computer lab, you know, and I'm sorry, the principal said the lights can't be turned out in here. Yeah, not my rule. Uh, but but there, there's a whole new syndrome kicking in. And, and the boys are usually behind the girls. Not all of them. No, there, there are enough guys with hormones and muck that it, it makes the game work. Okay, what, what else happens at that age? Had these nice, normal little kids bringing home good grades, doing... You just get them trained to be elementary school kids, and then they hit junior high. Changing schools, going to junior high, meeting new friends and enemies as well. So. <laughs> okay, Ch yeah, change of location, change of people. Robert, and then we'll come back. I was gonna say I was gonna say drugs, but now kids are getting into drugs and stuff and alcohol in like second and third grade. Oh, but, we left that but, uh, out. We forgot about <laughs> the drug problem. I can hit them when they're like second. Sometimes some first graders experiment with alcohol, but there's been known second and third graders experimenting with drugs and alcohol. Okay. Uh, Laura, and Laura. I think the kids get into that because of peer pressure, whether it's drugs, <laughs> alcohol, dating early, um, going to youth group with your church. I mean, that's all peer wanting to be like your friend or finding <laughs> someone you admire and wanting to be like them. Okay, what were you going to say? I was going to comment that junior high throws a few more curves at you just other than the fact that it's a new school. It's frequently a bigger school. You were also in school not only with, you know, fifth grade, you hit the, the top of the mountain. You were, you know, the big kids of the school, and suddenly, boom, you're back at the bottom again. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, in fact, I know in some school districts they've actually worked to try and keep the sixth graders off in a separate area to protect them a little bit from the big eighth graders who might come along and beat them up. But... Also, it's um, you're now you're having to change classes a lot. You know, it's a, there, it's a little bit like a miniature high school as opposed to, you know, an elementary school. You spend a lot of time with one teacher. Yeah, you might go out for computer, out for PE, maybe language, um, uh, science lab. There, and there's some of that to get them accustomed to the transition. But lots of changes once you hit middle school. Rows and rows, just finding your own locker can be... Uh, if you're particularly short or have any kind of physical, you know, uh, attributes that stand out among others, then the kids are particularly hard on you, you know, a short sixth grader. And I've noticed, like in seventh grade with my boys, that that seems to be the year that if you don't get the right pair of tennis shoes, that you are unmercifully treated about the whole year. It's just the shoes. They don't care much about anything else. So clothing, if you wear the same thing too many times in a row, you know, they just pick on you. Yeah. Now, when my girls were in middle school, it was, it, they had to have guest labels on their jeans. You know, and I, I gave the money for the jeans, and they spent their money to buy the label. You know, and they, and you couldn't take the label off of an old pair of jeans and sew it on to a cheap pair. Because the, just like with tennis shoes, with the jeans, they had memorized the stitching. And they knew which brands had what color stitching on them. And, they, you know, they could <coughs> spot, we won't insult any brands here, but the wrong brands had the wrong colors <laughs> and the identifiable places and so forth. And that was a big deal. But now it's shoes. And, and you've got kids in, in kindergarten and first grade, too, wearing shoes that light up. And, but particularly by middle school, that's an even bigger deal. You have a lot more expectations. <clears throat> I'm sorry. People have a lot more expectations about the work you should be doing. And uh, you have, a, I mean, the work gets harder as you get into junior high. You have more authority figures that you have to deal with as well as, um, you know, the, the socialization with new people, cliques are formed real easily, and then you have the problem of alienation going on also that you have to deal with. In my daughter's middle school, the cliques are real obvious and they dress the same. There's the bangers. Why don't you roll this way? Or <coughs> <laughs> He's looking for you with the camera. The camera. There's the bangers and the kickers and the preppies and the grunges and the, you know, I mean, you can go on and on, but they dress differently and they hang together and it's 
real obvious and, and they don't like each other if they're in the other group and they really, the, the Grunges really don't like the prissy little girls and you know, I mean it's just, it's real, the lines are there very strongly. Even standing out in front of the school before school starts. Where I went to junior high school they had the eighth grade corner which was like, <laughs> you know, the big place you wanted to be. And all, as a sixth grader, I remember looking in awe at all the people that were there. And I <clears throat> happened to have grown up in a neighborhood with two or three of them. But as eighth graders, they wouldn't talk to me as a sixth grader, you know. And then also, um, with like Ginger was saying, with the, the clothes, if you were... Uh, a girl that still dressed in a tomboyish manner or you didn't wear makeup and all the rest of your friends were you were ostracized for that as well you know yeah, go ahead uh, one of the things that seems to uh, partic be particularly disturbing is you know at this point in your life you think that you're the only one that feels this way in just this mass of people and a lot of the counselors do counseling groups just to show um, the children that are in crisis that there's other people that are going through the same thing you are. Okay, y'all have missed a biggie that kicks in at this point. Well, what happens? Friend, girlfriend, they fall in love? Or well, they fall in love. No, what happens to the skin? <laughs> Zits. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. We spend vast amounts of money every month, so our daughter won't have them. Okay, and you're not alone. No. There are millions of millions Americans out of Americans. there paying for Accutane and Clearasil and whatever all that other stuff is. We've, we've worked our way through that. And, all. and what's kind of scary is you see how much of, like what you're talking about in middle school is exactly the stuff I have been seeing in high school, so it's obviously, and I remember being that way too, that, that middle school is trying very hard to ape high school. They're trying as much as possible to be just little miniature high school kids, and they try and dress like them and act like them and develop cliques like them and everything. And I, I, I can remember back to um, where I grew up, sixth grade was still part of the elementary school, so we didn't go to junior high till seventh grade, and I can remember that first day of junior high and thinking, this is it, I'm growing up now. I'm really part of the big time. I mean, I'm going to learn a few more things, but I'm there now. And how long did it take for the awakening to occur? Uh, Days actually, or I'm, weeks? Or? I'm, I'm not sure when I really figured it out. I think it's about the time I hit high school I figured out that, oh, there's a whole lot more to go. Okay. Any of you have to deal with gangs? want to comment on that? Did, well, what, did you deal with it in middle school or was it high school? Before um, you know? It was middle school. Um, I went to middle school in Montrose and um, <clears throat> this was a time there was a gang called the Smurfs that were out. I, yeah, yeah, you I remember, remember hearing that. about those? Okay. Well, um, this I never knew how real it was. Well, this, it was very real to us. I mean, they had, you know, through word of mouth, everyone had heard about it, and there was this, you know, you never really saw a lot of them. You saw the offspring wannabe groups like the Smurf gang. And I encountered one of those one day waiting after school. I used to have to wait till about 5 o'clock for my mother to come pick me up. And um, apparently they just walked by one day and thought that I was looking at them the wrong way. And so they started to harass me and do all kinds of nasty things. And so I, you know, was scared out of my mind. I ran upstairs to the vice principal's office. Of course, everyone had left, but the secretary was nice enough to take me to my house, which was nice. That's so, good. But, I mean, it was, no, that was the only experience, and not, nothing compared to today, I'm sure. Then you had the presence of mind to know what to do, too, and where to go for help. Okay, as you make that transition on into high school, does it change much or are the problems the same? Well, they're, they're a little more severe. You, re, you, you know, the kids who have figured it out are starting to realize, I only have a few more years and then people are expecting me to like, be a grown-up and figure out kind of what I'm starting to do. And there's a lot of kids who I think are desperately trying to avoid being forced to grown-up 
to grow up and stuff because I think they were terrified of what that means or or not sure they're going to know what to do and so they're you know trying to how to hang on to not being that and um, and then a lot of the stuff that we're talking about as far as medical school is just sort of magnified you're at an even bigger school probably you have a lot bigger scarier people um, and and the peer pressure to do a lot of the you know the drugs the alcohol and dating and all that stuff you know is is far more intense so and of course then there's the pressure of do you have a car or not mm. you know that, do you that, have any money and the pressure is there to prove yourself to be very, very responsible in the eyes of every adult around you so that you can gain their trust so that you can further advance your chances at getting a car or getting to stay up late past curfew or even having a curfew that's past, you know, 10 o'clock, you know. I was, I was a senior in high school and I still had a midnight curfew and I thought that was very unusual because all my friends' curfews were till about 1 o'clock. It's also a problem of trying to find a place uh, for the individual when, when you're in high school at that, you know, at that weird age. And uh, I think I was lucky enough to have, like, I was in the, the fine arts. I was in choir and band. So I kind of had a clique that was halfway decent, I mean, as opposed to a gang or something like that. That was, you know, a positive thing to do. And uh, I think that's a big problem that I see today is that uh, there's no, you know, people need to find some kind of activity or group to get in. It's going to benefit them in some way during the high school experience. Okay, and a lot of people aren't in any of those kinds of groups, or so it doesn't appear. Mm -hmm. Seems like a lot of crises start over uh, relationships that have ended, you know, and he'll start, and the guy, you know, two break up, and then the guy starts dating someone else, and then the girls get unhappy with each other, or it could be vice versa. But handling the, the ending of relationships that have probably been, you know, a lot stronger than they've experienced before. Okay, there's a little bit of that in middle school, a, a lot for some in middle school, but certainly by high school, more are getting into it. And we'll look later on, and when Dr. Williamson comes, we'll be talking a lot about social attraction and relationship uh, dissolution. And there's some actually identifiable, actual identifiable stages in that strategies that are used to break uh, couples up and so forth. But that's very traumatic. And here you're supposed to be making grades, good grades, at the same time, you know, somebody dumps you two hours before you have an exam and you're supposed to be able to cope with this. Well, and unfortunately it's really gotten big where they have a lot of problem with suicides and, and certainly threatened suicides in high schools. I mean, I think there's maybe some of that in middle school, but the bulk of what I what I've heard of and stuff all seems to be high school, and 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 some of it I think is related to these um, relationships and breaking up and stuff. Some of it I don't know all the all the sources behind it, but that does seem to be a big problem. Okay, do you know the kinds of things that precipitate teen suicide, Robert? They usually, they're usually alone a lot. Uh, they're, right? Isn't that one of the... Okay, well, I was looking for the kind oh. of circumstances oh. that might... Lend, yeah, we'll look at the whole unit on suicide in a couple of weeks. Uh, but certainly, yeah, people that are isolated and don't have a support group are going to be more vulnerable in any crisis. Divorce. Okay, parents may divorce and... Children feel responsible, whether they're adolescents or elementary or very young. Nancy? Another thing is if one of their peers commits suicide, then the idea is planted in a lot of the kids' minds, and sometimes there's copycat suicide. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are some other problems that teens get into? There's a, the schools Judy. today, I believe, there's, there's more violence. I mean, you got to be afraid to go to school because there's kids carrying guns now. And I can remember my senior year in high school, they put metal detectors in my school. And now it, it's ten times worse. Uh, it's worse because of the metal detectors? or no, no, I miss something. The, the kids, that they, ha they have accessibility to these guns. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I, I told you that I do volunteer work at a boy's home. They can point out the people. They can say, you know, this is where I get my gun. They'll bring it into the home when, when they first enter the program. And it, it was very shocking at first, but it's nothing to them. And if, you know, if you're not careful, they'll carry it out of the house and carry it to school with them. Mm -hmm. It was surprising to me, I overheard a conversation with some teenagers talking about how many of the boys, and I don't know about the girls, but it was among boys, had guns in their possession or in their cars. It was just real disturbing to me that that even would be in their hands. I remember the first time one of my daughters came home from school <coughs> and, and named the fellow at school who had shown her a handgun, and I went, he did what? You know, oh yeah, we were at lunch and you know, we went by his locker and he showed me his gun. I wasn't real happy about that and you know, but we kind of rolled with the punch. I said, would you just stay away from this person, please? <laughs> and all, but you know, I probably should have called the principal or something, but I didn't. Oh, excuse me. You're I think a, another big issue with teenagers in high school is um, the dwelling on sex a lot, who's having it, who's not, not so much, not even so much in relationships, but uh, birth control, disease, you know, are you popular if you have it, are you unpopular because you do or you don't, that all those issues, I think that's a big topic for Now, that which age. way are you going to be worse off, to participate and be with this group or not participate and be over here in this cluster and ostracized by that group? And, and a subsequent effect of participating is teen, teen pregnancy. pregnancy. Okay, and, and that certainly has a rippling effect, doesn't it? And it leads you into existential crises. What's the existential crisis? Is that more like crisis of belief and crisis of, of um, kind of what do you do with your life? Yeah, well, yeah, an existential crisis is one that challenges your beliefs and your values. And so here you've got two parents who've been absolutely opposed to abortion because that's what their church teaches, and they've suddenly got a 13-year-old daughter who's pregnant. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to change your values? Are you going to ship the girl off to some private school for a year? and pretend she's being academically enriched or whatever. Um, yeah. And, you know, I can remember in high school those girls that disappeared about 10th or 11th, and I was too naive to know what was going on. You know, I really thought they were going off to finishing school or whatever. Okay. Uh, as you get older, it becomes your own crisis. I mean, it will ripple out and affect other people, but once you're old enough to go out and get your own abortion, uh, then if, if you're really, you know, do it with finesse and so forth, your parents and family and friends may not even know anything about it. But, but the whole realm of, of teen pregnancy, I think you were sharing a story with me earlier. Well, uh, you know, I know of an instance where a, a, a young woman or teenager uh, boyfriend broke up with her and she thought if she could get pregnant by him that their relationship would get back together and there's no real stipulation as to walking around a high school in most cases pregnant these days you know they have on care facility I mean babysitting for the girls in some campuses and so it, you know it becomes a crisis a lot of these girls think that getting pregnant is going to make things better, which indeed it you know creates more uh, more complex situation for them to deal with at such a young age. Kara? Yeah. In fact, it was probably a few months ago, um, I was home, you know, watching one of the millions of soap uh, of talk shows, mm -hmm. and they had on several girls who were about 14, who were all at least had verbalized that they were seriously interested in and in becoming pregnant, and. And there, you know, one of, one of the major themes was the very classic thing of the baby will love me. 
you know, implying that I don't feel like everyone else does, but this will this is a way to ensure that someone will. But without much thought for how they're going to support this child, how they're going to manage. Mm -hmm. Not only do you have the teenager a girl or boy involved in it, then the parents get involved in it and the two sets of parents may or may not know about it, but if they know about it, they may have different views of how they want the situation handled and it just becomes more and more complex and, and uh, difficult for the teenager. Yeah. I think of a, a newspaper story, it's probably a year old or so, where uh, the young man was filing for a court injunction to stop the woman from having an abortion. I think these people were probably in their early 20s. But, you know, you, we'll talk about systems theory later on and how family units and, and different units interrelate with one another and how one part affects another part. So for those of you who've been through theory class have heard this already. You know, but, but you get this rippling, impacting effect because all these parts are interdependent. And then when you get into existential crises where, where one portion of the people affected has one viewpoint and over here there's another viewpoint, then the values are coming into clash. Uh, you know, traditional family values may be challenged, religious values may be uh, turned upside down as you try to work through the pragmatic versus what you've believed. Um, you know, there are instances where grandparents are raising children because the young adults were not responsible enough to do that. And, and so you get a very complicated scenario. Okay. I don't know if you can put your hands on right now. We had an article, newspaper article, about uh, young adults in transition and how it was taking longer to grow up. We were, we were talking, I think Karen was saying uh, that it's, it's taking, you're being forced to make career choices and yet at the same time it's taking longer to get into the job market. Uh, you have, I won't ask how many of you are still living at home, but uh, the data shows that, that it's taking you longer to get out of the nest. It's taking longer to make that transition into careers. There seems to be a pattern that we're in, and I, I don't know what the causes of that are. But, Allison? Well, a lot of parents that I know now are encouraging their college students to stay home as long as possible because they know that it'll be such a struggle for them to try to, you know, live by themselves and support themselves, whereas there are other parents that are just ready to get them out, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people are finding it more beneficial to have, you know, to stay at home with the parents because, number one, you can have financial support, but also you maybe have more emotional support that you wouldn't be able to necessarily find in a roommate also. Karen? I have um, friends at church who's... Um, when their son, you know, they had both when they turned 18, you know, these, these are people even a little bit older than I am, and when they turned 18, you know, they moved out on their own and got jobs and, you know, kind of took up living as adults. And so when their children, teenage children turned 18, you know, the, the father sort of expected that, okay, you're going to move them out. And the mother had to say, no, you can't do that to them, because she had to point out to him that their son who was, you know, going, still going to school, but was carrying as much of a job as he could manage and still pull down decent grades, <coughs> was just earning enough money to pay the payments and the insurance on his truck. He didn't. He was not earning enough money mm -hmm. to 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 pay for any portion of an apartment or utilities or anything else you'd have to do if you were going to try and live on your own. Did you find some data there. It's, uh, it's an article from the Daily Cougar News Service. Young people today are the most but not the best educated in history and are taking longer to become self-supporting adults than earlier generations, a new government report asserted. Americans in their 20s are living at home longer, delaying marriage, and living on declining salaries, the U.S. Department of Education found in its Youth Indicators 1988. So this was six years, seven years ago. But I don't think it's gotten any better. It said, um, 
I've it's, only gotten one out of three out of the nest. So. <laughs> the report discovered that the median annual income for men aged 20 to 24 fell to $14,000 in 1985 from $18,000 in 1970. The median age of women who entered their first year of marriage climbed by two and a half years. Kids are becoming adults later and having sex sooner, getting married older, and getting pregnant younger. Boy, isn't life wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> there are more really depressing statistics in this article but about drug and alcohol use. And okay, thanks for finding it. We had that somewhere. We have an assortment of things here. Okay. But by high school, people are expecting you to figure out what you're going to be when you grow up. And let's not forget independence from your parents, trying to, the struggles, the power struggles that go on at home, trying to yeah. find yourself and... Oh, would well, somebody like to do a power struggle? We have a oh, teenager. Karen, you're there. Oh. oh, all right, here comes the power struggle. Nancy, did you want to be the parents? <laughs> Put your earrings on, Mom. I'm just going to stand here and mediate and be the okay. microphone. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that may not have a lot to do with it. Sometimes the earrings are in the mouth. There's that. There's that. Maybe y'all should hold those puppets up and turn uh, around to the camera so they can at least get a. Uh, they're so marvelously oh, decorated here need with some help. hoop earrings yeah, and. Yellow yeah. pom poms in the hair. Okay, I'll check for the um, is, um, is that one a hippie? Well, no, yeah. it, it's um, I'm not sure the appropriate Oops. term, but, but it's a she, free spirit. Um, it, it, she's wearing a um, safety pin <coughs> over one eye here. I oh, ouch! <laughs> oh. <laughs> a pierced <laughs> eyebrow. Yes, the, the you know part of the decoration <laughs> of choice here. <laughs> Can we discuss what the crisis is going to be about before we begin? Yes. Pick, pick a crisis. Uh, Perhaps you should pick the address. crisis. Here we go. How about I don't like your boyfriend. You can't see him anymore. Oh. <laughs> 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 Would you like to participate in this? You, want you to be can the best be the friend? sister. Come on or over. Or the sister. I'll be the boyfriend. Oh, <laughs> okay. Wait, y'all want to come up front? Oh, wow. Yeah, come up front. This would be better. Well, this will be wonderful. <laughs> okay, this, this will be a really good show. We'll copyright this one. Here, I'm going to put this on you. Okay, I want to know who this guy is and where you're going and all the details. I have, I don't know what I think about him yet. Mom, Mom, you just got to trust me. Hi there, yes. Oh, made me lose my earring. Oh, oh, here's the young man. Um, <laughs> don't listen to it. <laughs> hey, Mom, you just, you, you raised me, you taught me what you're supposed to, uh, supposed to do. <laughs> but you're just going to have to trust me now Can that I know what to do. stand over there a little bit? No, Mom, you're so close. I'm trying to talk to my daughter. <laughs> yeah, just take your arm off of her for just a moment, please. We're oh, Mom! Discussion here. Um, please, please, this is my house, and these are my rules, on, young go. man, and you're going to go let's find go yourself pizza. waiting out on the front porch if I can't have a discussion. Mom, Mom, daughter. look, either he stays or we both go. That's it. If you just listen her for a minute. Later on, you can sneak out and you should never know about it. Oh. Do I need to hear that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, sis. Thank okay, you. now tell me, where exactly are you going? And um, we don't have to tell you anything. Um, they're going with me. We're 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 going to a movie, and we'll I thought we were going to a club. No, we're going to a movie. Remember? So we're going to a movie, <laughs> oh. and um, we're we're, we're going to be back in about uh four hours. We'll call you from there and let you know. You're going with them? Yes. Remember? I told you the other day. Don't you remember? No, I don't remember that. Well, you said it was okay. And you told me it's always fine if I, as long as I double date with, with sis. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take care of it. Don't day, worry Mom. about it. I, believe me. Really? I'm worried Come about it. Let's you. go. Let's go. <laughs> it's time to go now. So the three of you are going? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, where exactly is this movie? Um, it's over um, 
It's, it's at in, the mall. It's in downtown Houston somewhere. We it's don't know at where. It's at the mall. <laughs> you know, I have three conflicting stories here. It's at the mall. It's at the mall. It's at the mall. Yeah, it's at the mall. That's right. That's right. It's at the mall. Okay, and what are you going to see? Um, Bambi, that's it. We're going to go see Bambi. Yeah, they reissued it. Yeah. Bambi and Pinocchio, it's a double feature. And when are you going to be back? Uh, what do you say? Four, four, four hours. hours. Yeah, yeah. Four see, hours. See, four see, hours. Two, you know, two hours each movie, right? Yeah. Right, I obviously right. are going to have to have a little trust in you. Can you make sure that you come back? And young man, um, I'm being very generous in letting you take my daughter out based on some of the uh, uh, behavior thanks, that you've thanks, shown Mom. me. Thank and you. you'll yeah, make yeah. sure that they come back. What what time was that again? Four hours. Four hours, yeah, Four yeah, hours. I'll be back. So, yeah. okay. so what time does your watch say? Um, my, my watch <laughs> says 6 o'clock. Oh, okay, that's cool. Ours does too. Yeah, so we'll be back at... Yeah, 10. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure he will. Yeah. Bye, Mom. Bye. Go Bye. 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 Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> I want to ask you if you ever really did that to your mom. <laughs> okay, that was very good. <laughs> <laughs> See how much you can learn from a sibling? Such a valuable resource. Okay, I, th I think she was giving you some skills that are the useful as you move on into college. Yeah. Sounded to me like. <laughs> so, does life change much when you move to college, when you get to college? You have to learn to be away from your parents um, for the first time. If, well, I mean, obviously, most of the majority of high school students to live with their families so moving away and going to a college nowhere near your family or even just down the street but living in the dorm is a, could be very traumatic okay and even if you stay home and go to college do things start to change well some of your professors it's a real shock I think for some freshmen that the professors aren't taking role don't seem to particularly care if you come to class or not and so a lot of people decide well it means I don't have to so they don't and they wonder why they don't seem to know what's on the test. Well, they have zeros in the grade book, yes. Okay, what about your relationship to your family? If, if some of you have stayed at home, do, do things change once you graduate? Okay. Yeah, the, the rules change. Um, when, when you move out or when you start going to college, you, you're, you start taking upon more responsibility and you think you can stay out as late as you want and your parents shouldn't have as much control over uh, where you're going to be. But young man, you still live under my roof. It uh, also depends on who's paying for that college education, of mm. course, because if the parents are paying for it, they certainly at least are going to feel like that they, you know, it's like, hey, I mean, I've made the investment here, let's make sure you're not wasting my money. If the student is paying for it themselves or has a scholarship, yeah, they may, I probably do have a little more freedom, or at least I would probably grant somebody more freedom under that circumstance. Okay, well you said the rules change. Who changed the rules? Did the parents change the rules? Did the student change the rules, or both? Or I think that the student tries to change the rules because it's his or her life that's changing, and then the student and the parents have to work things out. Okay, and you may have to negotiate some kind of balance there. Okay, but, but I would think that normally the rules would change, that you'd try to adjust the curfew or abandon the curfew in light of response. <laughs> Those kids of yours, I don't know. <laughs> you were interrogating well, but I don't know. She, she's <laughs> Allison Slick. She, <laughs> well, but you were coming to the rescue so well. You know. I wonder if I'll do that with my sister when she gets old enough, because she's only 15 right now, so she's just embarking on that journey. Well, right now, would you come to, if, if, um, if, if she's having a boyfriend over or something and, and discussing with your mom, would you get in um, for the discussion, and would you have done what you were doing just now? Well, probably to... A certain extent I'm at the point right now where I'm still mothering her a lot and um, it's, it, we're at a very interesting point because I'm mothering her but yet I'm also treating her as if she is my age which is kind of 
Can we hard. ask how old you are? Um, I am 24, okay. almost 25, and um, it's it's kind of difficult because I think back at the time, well, what was I doing when I was 15? And I don't want her, I mean, not to say everything I did was bad, but I don't want her doing those things, even though they might be perfectly normal. It, it, I come in a cross of where, you know, I, I love for her to come over, and if my friends come over, she's a part of whatever we do, you know. But on the other hand, I'm also this mothering figure that's, you know, Make sure you don't wear too much makeup. Make sure you don't swear. Make sure you've got the right clothes on. This shirt's too tight. You can't wear it. You know that one's too thin. Yeah, that one's too short. That <laughs> so I'm kind thin. of a, a, a catch twenty two situation. You know. So okay, this is kind of all, to all of you, given, given this scenario up here, would you intervene if you thought your own brother, your probably your sister, if if you thought either of your siblings was dating a sleaze bag? Would you try to break that? I mean, this guy was just extra friendly, but if, but if you thought, but but if you thought that she was really going out with a scumbag, I would definitely intervene. But there's also a big problem with that, as I found out with my family. I dated a, a very bad character early on in my life, and um, I'm sure we all have dated a bad seed here and there. But uh, intervention is sometimes impossible. Um, because walls get built up and, you know, for instance, she, I may not like her boyfriend and it depends about how you go about presenting your conflict that you have because she might build up a wall and cut you out and just, you know, not even pay attention to you or if you can find the right entrance and squeeze in there and try to do it little by little, maybe you could show her the light a little. But ultimately, I think they decide for themselves. Okay, we're going to take an intermission, but let's think about this some more. Are there things that can be done to intervene, to have impact? Because this, this is a fairly common problem. So let's think about that, and we'll address it further shortly. <laughs>